Luke. Hello. Hi, Luke. Hiya, hiya. You're right. Very well. How are you? Yeah, yeah, very good, thank you, very good. I wasn't expecting you to be blonde. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it was definitely not a choice. I didn't think I'd ever dye my hair. It was um, <laughs> asked of me for the job I'm on now, and I, I very hesitantly said, yeah, okay, go on then. I've still got one day left of filming, so. Uh, hey, listen, at least, at least it's not gone ginger. <laughs> I mean, I mean it, did go, it did go really rusty at one point, and so it's like, it's it's just hanging in there, and there's so much root now as well. So it's like, it's a it's a desperate last attempt. It's a rush to get it finished before I completely have disgusting hair. Nice. So you've only got one day left. One day left of filming. I'm I'm back in on Wednesday, and then that's it. Game over. Done. Wow. Good work. Yeah. Good man. Because it's, it's proving impossible to find another job to get anything else. So going to be the only employment for the rest for, for at least the rest of this year if not a while into next year it feels no luke you'll always be working you're a talented young man i'm gonna i'm gonna try i'm gonna try and find something but um it's a tough it's a really tough time at the moment isn't it but what can you do yeah well thank you for all joining me today so today we're talking about panto oh yes we are is what we should all be answering there of course <laughs> Put that behind us. Exactly. Um, does, does that make me and Luke the back end of the of, of the horse then? Well, <laughs> if you want to self cast it, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it. To, I'll leave it to other that. people to do that. You know, at the moment, I'd take anything. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so we've got Simon Sladen, the founder of Panto Day and Panto Database, and editor for British Theatre Guide up at the top, with a wealth of Panto experience and updates in his Twitter feed. Um, down below, we've got Irvin Iqbal, who is the only actor to be in all three British South Asian West End musicals. And played Sultan in Aladdin for three years, was it? Yeah, three years. Wow, and then most recently, The Boy in the Dress. That's right. Which I saw, which was stunning. Really, oh, really you. good work. Thank you. And we know it's coming to the West End at some point. Okay. Yeah, we don't know. Or sure when. Yet, yet to be announced. To yet be... to be announced. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, Luke Latchman. There we go. Brilliant actor. Art said trained. Played Dick Winterton in the Lyric Theatre Hammersmith production, which is coming to the National Theatre. Um, yeah, they're taking, they're taking the script. Um, so they're going to kind of revive the piece, update it a bit but they was very specifically, they actually really kindly sent us an email saying, um, just so you know, we're gonna do it again. It's gonna be announced soon, um, but we're not gonna use any of the same company because we don't want it to be like a revival. We want to do a whole new thing, which honestly, I was so thankful for them to yeah. just let us know because over lockdown, there's been a lot of announcements and stuff that have just happened and actors have literally found out on social media. So actually to get an email saying, even to get an email saying, we're going to do something, you're not getting the job, was really, you know, really nice and really kind of polite of them, if you will. So, yeah, the show is coming back, but I, I wish I was. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you are busy filming Cinderella. Well, when you say busy... <laughs> <laughs> you're booked on the I've got a day. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Right, so we should really kind of start off with something that we all kind of picked up on and we all certainly tweeted about it was the release of the two panto posters for Beauty and the Beast in St. Helens, Theatre Royal and Aladdin at Billingham Forum. Um, so yes, yeah, so, I mean, aside from the terrible photoshopping in the design <laughs> work, which was offensive in itself, um, <laughs> we've, we've got to talk. I mean, the, the, the first thing was well, there was seven actors in the Beauty and the Beast picture. And what can we say? All white. I mean, I think it's important to say here that we know that there's 42 pantos going ahead. Of the casting that's been revealed so far, of those 42 casts, only three black performers have been announced in 42 shows. That That is a striking statistic, given yeah. what you know, the year we've seen from industry and outside the industry, the importance of, 
inclusivity, diversification, a lot of people speaking very openly about the need to ensure casting and narratives reflect, you know, the great British public and all that's been going on around the world. And yet we've hit this period where it isn't changing at all. And of all the posters that have been released so far, there is only one that is not all white. And there are companies out there with two shows, with three shows this year that have cast only white casts. Yeah, of course. We've got Jacob McIntosh as Jack and, in Jack and Two Meter Beanstalk. Correct, replacing Lucy Reed. So that's a, that's been a swap of a, a cast um, there. Yes, absolutely. So we've got him in Seven Oaks. Um, we've got Yona Higgins, who was announced yesterday at Otter's Pool Adventure in Liverpool. She's playing Spirit of the Ring. Um, and then Marlene Littlehill uh, in Portsmouth uh, at the King's playing Fairy Bow Bells. In Dick Whittington, yeah. Um, but this is what I was going to ask, because we all know that Panto, historically, is cast quite well in advance. And obviously a lot of these castings might have been from earlier in the year, from possibly the end of last year. So is it... Is it a case of that is a case of that are we expected too much for the castings to have changed and to see anything right now or should we be expecting things to change the next yes year? absolutely i mean we're in 2020 um i mean what simon has um just you know told us i'm, I'm grateful to you simon for those statistics by the way um i mean th this this th this tells us about the backward mentality um, of 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 this this subsection of this industry, and remember, this has not been going on in 2020. It's been going on for the last 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 years. You know, we have a you know a pool of talent um, in this country, um, of diverse talent. Um, and what this tells me, from what Simon's statistics has just showed, is that nothing nothing is changing. No one is. You know, none of these production companies, none of these theatres, none of the casting directors are looking towards this pool of talent, um, which is in surplus. You know, we have shows, you know, non-panto shows, pan um, some panto shows, plays, you know, that, that, that showcase talent, showcase diverse talent. So if it's precedented in these productions, in these theatre productions, why is it not represented elsewhere? Why are we still having this backward mentality? Why are we not reflective of the society with the talent pool? I, I, I can't comprehend. I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually um, concerned. You know, we're here debating it in this forum. We shouldn't be having to debate this issue. You know, I shouldn't be here and anyone should be debating this issue. This should be normal practice. I, I feel bad when I tweet things about, well, you know, shows are not being representative because I shouldn't be tweeting those things because it should be happening. Yeah. I think it's... Um, sorry, after you, Simon. No, no, go, Luke. Go, go, go. I, I was just going to say, I think um, an, a, an excuse, if you will, that gets thrown about a lot is people aren't available. And I just think that's hilarious at this time. Like, we can't, we couldn't be any more available right now. Like, we are so heavily unemployed. Like, the whole arts interferes. And I understand that that means everyone of all, um, all, all colors, creeds, religions, everyone's unavailable. I get that. But so if you have ev anyone and everyone to choose from, you can't use that excuse of the talent isn't available because everyone's available. So share the love, spread the jobs, spread the, spread the art and include everyone. Don't just hire the one type of person or the one mold and, um, I know this is slightly separate, but I just got to get it off my chest. I do have a particular uh, ir irritation towards specifically towards the show Aladdin um, as, as a panto. I think if you're going to take a show, if you're going to take a piece that is so rooted in where it's based and what, what the, what the, what's going on around it, if you will. And, and the, yeah, the location of it, I just mean, if, if, if you want to do that one show, be sensitive to that and, and just think about that. And I, 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 it's always really bugged me. I have to say, it's always bugged me seeing a, what, a fully white cast in a show that's clearly not about white people. And, and maybe, that's, maybe that's extreme. Maybe that's unfair of me to say. But I, I just, yeah, it, re it really gets me. It's like, if you want to do that one show, 
you best have the right cast ready for it. You best just have a bit of a diverse cast. If you don't, do another show. There's 10 other Pantos out there that do the exact same thing. Panto is a very, and, and I say this with love, it's a bit of a one trip pony. Like they're all the same thing. They all have a structure and they all have a story, but really you're only coming to see 10 conventions that are the same in all of them. So if you don't have the cast for Aladdin, do Dick Whittington, do any of the other shows, Snow White or anything, but yeah, that, sorry, it just, that really irritates me. Or, or, or do Aladdin and be representative of the talent pool. Exactly, exactly. I mean, has it not commercially worked already? Is it not precedented that it's worked already? You know, I, I, Luke is absolutely right, but we see this year in, year out, even amongst celebrities, you know, there are white celebrities playing either Princess Jasmine or, or the leading role of Aladdin. White celebrities doing that. Yeah. I understand the bums on seats, the commercial, the commercial motivation in doing that. I totally understand that. But there's not just white celebrities or, you know, female or male out there that can play those parts. I think Aladdin is a really interesting one. And, and we've had it as a, as a panto in the form we know it since 1788. And these, these debates are not just things that have come up this year. Certainly for the last five years, um, Platform the Stage, industry newspaper, has presented this debate. Some of you might remember in 2018 when there was a production with characters with equally um, as racist names, uh, you know, um, Chow Mein, Slave, and things like that. It always reminds me, though, as a pantomime historian, back in 1900, the Star newspaper wrote of the Drury Lane pantomimes, only a great nation would have done such a thing only an undisciplined nation would have done it, showing that actually what's being presented is part of that ideology. And let's not forget, fairy tales teach us, young people, lots of things. So if you're going to the venue and you're seeing no representation on the stage, or you're only seeing the villain played by a black actor, what does that tell us constantly, year after year after year, that gets ingrained? And here we are generally talking of the commercial sector, those big, big shows, Hackney Empire, Stratford East, you know, Lyric Hammersmith, they understand the importance of, of diversity, not only in reflecting the community, uh, but of ensuring that those narratives speak to a contemporary audience. Nottingham Playhouse, Oldham Coliseum, also doing those type of things. You know, when Hackney Empire produced Aladdin, uh, recently they didn't have the name of the Chinese policeman. They changed those to local cuisines, Dumpling and Aki, for example. Wishy Washy was not called Wishy Washy, a reference to the Chinese laundries of the Victorian period. It was called Dishy as a result. We still have Widow Twanky everywhere, which what is a derogatory name in essence, because it was making fun of a very cheap version of tea, the Twang K tea, um, but that has stuck. And I think it's also interesting to think about um, Aladdin, uh, where is it set? You know, 1991 Disney really bringing a new aesthetic and place for it. The early versions of that, the first translations are, are yes, set in a province in China, but the character, um, Aladdin's dad, is a tailor called Mustafa. So that there you have a sort of a, a Muslim name and there's always been this um, intercultural um, depiction of where that exactly is set. And well, that, that, that came that came from the Frenchman, didn't it? The who I uh, forget his name was it Galland who picked it up the story from um, a Syrian academic. So he was he was based that this the the, the, the the Syrian academic was based actually in Aleppo, where everything's being bombed at the moment, and he passed that story to the Galland, who then took it to Paris and made it into a thousand one Arabian Nights. But it, the reason why you have those Muslim references is it was, it was his idea of what China would like. He'd actually never been to China. Um, and we don't have a name for this scholar, by the way, who's from Aleppo. Only Galan's um, um, uh, books tell us that he met, this, he met this academic. But it was his idea of what China would look like. But he was based in, his, his imagination was what he saw around him, which was obviously Syria, Persia at the time. Hence you have these names like Mustafa and you know, mm -hmm. Jafar being of a more origin. Um, so, it, it, and, and yet, all these stories have been romanticized, have been recycled into what we have today, uh, which has no, ha, which never reflects on those historical influences. 
No, I mean, 1721 is that earliest one that you're talking about there. And yeah. absolutely. And the location actually is described as, and I'll just quote, because I looked it up because I thought it might be interesting. The capital is set in the capital of one of the largest and richest provinces in the kingdom of China. So yeah. pretty, pretty could, could be anywhere. Yeah. Another character that I, I just want to mention here relating to this, we, we should probably talk about the Chinese policeman that were on the poster. The poster has been changed now to the policeman. Um, is Abanaza, the villain, who originally appears as the African magician. Now, of course, we've seen the evolution of that role give that character a name, just like a lot of the Slave of the Ring, the slave part has gone and it's Spirit of the Ring or it's got a character. Um, and actually, uh, a, a young black producer, Chichi Nago, said, would we have had this debate if that character was called the African uncle and it was a white person depicted on the poster? I don't think anybody would have cast it as that, but for some reason, having it as Chinese policeman, it's not it's not picked up by as many people or, or rendered in the same way as it was. And I think that is the issue here. People need to be aware of the very importance that that poster plays. And, and around Christmas time, posters are everywhere and it's about representation. We've seen it debated in magazines and I think we're going to talk about film later. Um, these are key issues and, you know, it's not enough to say, oh, I'm not racist. We need to be anti-racist and we need to then address those issues. This debate, as I said, 1900, Philip Hedley at Stratford East, uh, he was the artistic director there and in the 80s was the first really to push the, the multicultural cast, diverse casting. And in the 1984 review in the stage, they were quite surprised because they wrote, and I quote, the Prince is Brown. They just... Uh, probably in history, the first ever non-white prince in the pantomime. That's 1984. Yeah, so let's, we'll, we'll move on to that then. So we've, we've talked about the casting, but obviously systemic racism within the writing itself, as identified there, where they have, not only on the poster, it, it, it extends on the fact that they can then erase it from the poster. They've still got those characters in that show. And those characters have still been developed and written, and it, there's a lot of accountability, I think, within this. You've got the person who writes a character like that, and then a producer who creates a panto, which includes that character, and then an actor who accepts that part, and then an audience who accept it and pay to see it. So, I think it's, it's fair to say there's a, we can't blame any one of those people, but we can at least take it right back to the writer who, essentially initiates this. Without their input at the beginning, we wouldn't have that character. So in the case of the Chinese policeman at the Billingham Forum, this is written by Liam Meller, who is younger than me, I discovered. He's, and he's from Middlesbrough, where I'm from. So it's, it's not a case of, you can look at some pantos and think, then perhaps out of touch or they don't have the right influences around them. And he trained himself at Drama Studio in London in 2008. So, and then gone into Panto and worked extensively across Panto. So he's very well informed. So it's, he doesn't really have any deniability as far as I'm concerned. And his response was quite interesting, wasn't it? So I know you challenged him particularly, Irvin, didn't you? I did. Um, and then he blocked me straight away, which was, yeah. very, which was very, very disappointing because, uh, you know, I find that generally disappointing because we're not here to, you know, aggressively, no. uh, you know, uh, point fingers at people. But the, the, you know, the idea is that we need to debate, debate the, these issues, you know, intelligently, you know, in a sensitive way um, and, 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 and ask these questions, you know, why, why is this happening? I, you know, and I'm disappointed, Liam. Uh, blocked me because I was quite happy even to have a telephone conversation with him you know nice a nice you know um, a nice chat with him but yeah. he blocked me and I, mean, I think he mentioned something about oh he'd been to China and a lot of his writing had been influenced by his travels to China which so I challenged him and I said well you know if you've if you've been to China you know um, why do we not see that you know reflective in in the cast and then the minute I asked that he blocked me straight away but I mean, I mean, this, this is the thing, you know, Liam's, Liam's, Liam's from that area. And this goes back to my previous point about mentality. I think a lot of theatres are stuck on this same record, you know, 
a lot of communities are relying on them in their writing to be informed about, you know, through entertainment, through channels of entertainment. You know, children are watching those shows, you know, from the local communities. So we've been depending on the same writers, the same record for, for tens and 20, 30 years. And that record is not changing. There seems to be some kind of template to it that they think it's entertaining. You know, and we have to challenge that as professionals say, well, hold on a minute. You know, who are you to decide that? The world has changed. Generation has changed. The country has changed in terms of its society. Um, attitudes towards um, race, attitudes towards popular culture. You know, we are a different world today than we are 10 years ago, 15 years ago, even five years ago. So who are these people to decide all of these things? You know, and, and, and inform their audience of it. We, you know, that needs to be addressed too. Yeah, because it's a, a, a lean towards people saying the word tradition and it, this is a traditional panto and it, like you say it, it's something traditionally systemic tradition doesn't mean it's right no. exactly, exactly. Um, you know it was a tradition up until the 1970s for everyone to get around the television and watch the black and white minstrel show but you know it was then just decided rightfully that that should not be there anymore and also let's not beat around the bush here Tanning up still happens in pantomime. People playing emperors of Morocco or spirits of the ring and thing. It, it tradition is there and is used as an excuse. Is used as an excuse. It's part of our Christmas. You need to have Christmas dinner if it's there. But it's a very, very old-fashioned way of looking at things. Hackney Empire, Lyric Hammersmith, you know, Stratford East. Their shows don't fit that Victorian sensibility. And actually. That's also another myth because the Victorian pantomimes were very, very different to what we see today. Newly commissioned each year, responding to things, satirical. The problem is, is that 1980s onwards, basically the same scripts are being used now and they're not updated each year. It's a, it's a conveyor belt approach. I've got that set. I've got those costumes. I've got this. There it goes. Nobody bothers looking at it. Someone might tweak the script a little bit to make it like that um, or, or to update it. Okay, we're not doing weakest link jokes anymore. We're doing this. And actually, you can trace some of those big company scripts back to the 1980s, that, those core, core scripts. Um, and just picking up on a point before that was being made about audiences, uh, audiences do rightly, uh, you know, write in and complain, but they often don't get a response yeah. or it's reflected upon. There are examples, for example, at Seven Oaks, where they have always ensured that there is there isn't an all white cast. And I think it was two or three years ago they had a letter of complaint saying the cast was too black because it had more black performers in than white people in Seven Oaks. Um, and Jamie Alexander Wilson, the producer there, went, "Well, that's ridiculous. What, like, what what, do you, what does that even mean?" But racism from audience members is there. Sheila Ferguson in Canterbury had to experience racist heckles during a production. Now, that blows my mind because it is, it's, it's disgusting to be racist, but to also then use that as an opportunity to express your racist values in the, in the thing, such as pantomime where she's playing the fairy, is mad, but tradition is, is laziness. And actually there's a whole school of thought, which I totally agree with, is that tradition is laziness. It's easy to do. Just do the same thing all the time. That's boring. Diversity is, is the key. We need new stories. We need, to, we need to freshen this all up. And I think, you know, having, having seen Luke in Dick Whittington, um, that is, in my opinion, and you can read my review, which testifies it, that was one of the best shows that Hammersmith did because it had scriptural integrity. I saw it too, by the way. And it was fantastic. It was yeah, really, it was. really great. Vibrant, new, honoured the past, was set in the present. And there are very easy things that you can do to absolutely explode that racism, misogyny, sexism, homophobia that's present in a Victorian construct. And I mean, Luke, I don't know what was that. What was your experience of of doing the panto of the, of the lyric? Uh, it's, it's it's funny you should say that. So I actually see quite a bit online of, of negativity about it not being a, a, diverse, a diverse enough place, and 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 then not doing enough for that. But I just. I did not experience that at all. I understand where people are coming from. It's, it's, the staff in there is, is very white, but the work they do for diverse communities and the stuff that they do, whenever I was there, any day that I was there rehearsing, there was a diverse group of young people there working with them or doing something or make, creating something. I just thought they were 
the most incredible company to work for. I really enjoyed my time there. I thought they really gave me all the tools I needed and I, I, just, I just thought they were brilliant and I had a great time on that. Um, something that you said before about, um, uh, so, so, so what irritates me about tradition and, and about scripts being traditional um, is you're happy to capitalize on, let's be honest, racial stereotypes and um, racial profiling and, and let's be frank, racist humor um, and make money off it in a medium that is so widely viewed. Like there'll be loads, so many audience members that only watch Panto. They, the only theater they consume is pantomime. And so for Panto specifically to not focus on diversity and to not open up the doors to everyone is is instantly closing the minds of so many audience members who this is the only theater they're gonna see. So if they see, the only theater they see is racist, is not inclusive, then that's, you know, that's, you're creating a really warped view of, of who we are and what we are as people. And um, I, I just think that's really upsetting. And um, it's really sad to hear in Canterbury, racist remarks being shouted as well. I, 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 in fact, I got one during Dick Whittington and it's such a diverse show but one audience member decided to shout out, go back to where you came from um, at me during, during one of the shows, um, which at the time I just kind of shrugged off, laughed off, like, what can you do? Let's get through the show. But, you know, again, the staff were really on side. Like, Are you okay? Are you sure you want to continue? Is this all right? You know, like, and they were really sensitive about it because it still happens. And like I say, especially in Panto and for kids as well, if they if they come from families that don't necessarily value theatre as much or don't choose to go to theatre, they tend to go anyway because their schools will take them or they'll go with a, a youth group or um, a brownies or scouts or something like that will will take them to a panto. So it might be the only theatre they've ever seen and or possibly could be the only theatre they will ever see. And so I just think it's so, so vital for it to share the love and, you know, show proper diversity because we are so, especially in London, we are so diverse. So to not represent that, I just think is, is not good enough. I, I think we also talk, I mean, Luke's picked up on it and, and Simon did too about institutional. Um, a lot of these theatres, remember, are community theatres that are doing other shows, you know, uh, during other seasons. So kind of working in reps, so there may be a play going on or a musical going on as well. But these are shows that are in-house, that their own internal creative departments are producing. So for it to go from one show, to, from a play, to a musical, to a panto, is all, is all relative in the end. And they will get their, they will base their casting on, on, an, on another show that happened previously, or another musical that happened previously, or historic shows that they've done. It's all interconnected, you know, this, this line that we have, not just in Panto, you know, I mean, we've debated this issue outside of Panto with musicals and plays, mm. but it's all relative in, in the end, institutionally. And that, that's why I go back to my point before about the mentality is that we need to now, or something needs to happen in our industry where that mentality needs to change. Okay, we've acknowledged the traditional things and we've also, we, we accept that, you know, it could be, it was tradition. It's not necessarily the right, you know, the right thing if it was tradition, but let's have this think tank and let's be intelligent enough to go, right, the world has changed. Let's be, um, let, let, let's, let's change the mentality a little bit. Let's be creative in our story writing, which is precedented with what you said before with Hackney and with Stratford East. You know, let's change this men mentality because we're capable of doing it because that's who we are as people. We're creative people. I want to talk about influences for you, both Luke and Irva, when you started your careers or even thought about becoming actors, what, I mean, did, were you influenced by the lack of representation? Did that drive you to want to, to work or did it put you off thinking that I, I, I don't see myself, I can't do it? How, how was it for you? That's exactly how it was for me. When I grew up, I went to all these, I'm, I'm from Bolton um, near Manchester. And I was at school up in Blackpool, so we saw all the Opera House um, pantos every year and um, all the Manchester Opera House pantos every year as a school. And I used to watch these shows and I was consciously going, well, where, where, is, my, where is my face represented up there? 
Um, and that's the reason, that, that's one of the reasons, apart from enjoying the business that we do, but that's one of the reasons why I went into, um, you know, I, I trained. And when I went for my audition uh, at the Royal Academy of Music, Mary Hammond asked me, she said, why do you want to, why do you want to get into this industry, Irvin? And I said, Mary, um, there's nobody of my background, of a South Asian background in this industry. And she was very, you know, she told me afterwards, uh, you know, I was, she was very proud of that answer, you know. So it's been, it's been with me since I was eight, eight years old. So yes, absolutely, it's, it's, it's influenced me. Sorry, Luke, Luke. <laughs> no, I was more interested to hear yours because I know mine, but I didn't know yours. Um, I, I think um, growing up, it, it kind of strikes me as, as humorous and bizarre now to think, when I was younger and I was watching things on TV and I was watching um, different forms of art, it was always very exciting to see someone who looked even vaguely like me because it was so rare. It was, it was like, a, oh my God, look, Mowgli, that's the one character I can relate to. Or, oh my God, look, Aladdin, that guy looks like me. And then there's the other hundred characters that don't look like me. And, and that's fine. I, I understand that. I don't expect it to be related, relatable to everyone. But, you know, maybe if you can chuck me more than just a few scraps, if you will, would, would, be, would be nice. Um, so I kind of fell in love with um, the musical film Chicago. And um, that my, my mum just kind of tried me a bunch of things. And I, this is going to sound like a really strange phrase, and I don't mean it in a horrible way. I grew up very white in, in terms of Canterbury is where I grew up. It was a very, very white community. There were two, two or three people of colour in my class. Um, and it, so it was, it was a very, um, I guess, other than being called racial slurs on the playground, it never really uh, occurred to me too much that I was different, if you will. Um, but yeah, it, it, was, it was more the case of watching film, TV and theatre and going, oh my God, look, the one person that looks like me in every three pieces I watched. And um, yeah, I just, think, I just think that's not good enough. I think, you know, it would be nice to be able to see a fair spread of different people and different types of people. <laughs> and I want to talk, because obviously you're now making the transition from theatre into film. How do we all feel about, I mean, do we feel that film is slightly ahead of theatre when it comes to representation or, I mean, even you spoke over recently about, I think it was Bradley Cooper's new film where he's cast Carrie Mulligan. Yeah. Carrie Mulligan, yeah, Carrie Mulligan. I, I, don't, I don't think it's changed across any of the uh, um, disciplines right. or genres, in, in, in my view. You know, even, even, I mean, if you observe it and assess it even in small parts when you watch feature films, you know, even the guy, you know, he, he has to be a taxi driver or a man in the shop, you know, to be from, from, from an ethnic background. It can't be the guy in the office, you know, or you know, or the av the average guy. So, my view is, and my assessment and my observation is, nothing has changed across all three all three disciplines. You know, st stage stage and screen, nothing has changed. It still remains unrepresented. It still remains not proportionate to the casting pool. And we need something drastic needs to happen. And th you know, I I. I I go off on a little tangent here when I say this, but, you know, I, I, we saw the announcements with the Oscars and that, that you know, now it's going to become criteria based, yeah, you know, exactly. BAFTA as well have announced their criteria, you know, and I think this is going to be the start of something, um, some kind of formula, because I think the next stage will be, um, will be funding. Um, a lot of these theatres, community theatres, the National Theatre, um, the Curve, even the larger commercial theatres, are funded. They're funded by the arts councils, they're funded by lottery money, and I think a lot of these funding organizations soon are going to be approached and going to be challenged and going, look, you're providing all this money to all these um, institutions, these theatres, um, film, um, you need to now do something because the Oscars and BAFTA have now set something in precedent. So I think those, those um, the funding influences will be a massive factor in the future. I do we um, think a guideline? So I'm so sorry. Can I just quickly um, on 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 that with film? Um, obviously, I'm very very new to all the, all the industry, all the performing arts industry as a whole. Um, so I can't, I don't come from a lot of experience. But 
from what I have seen, obviously film, there's a lot more money that goes into it. So it's, it's a much more expensive venture. And because of that, producers are even less willing to take a risk. And so, which is completely understandable because it's, it's big money you'd be losing if you do take a risk and it doesn't pay off. And so because of that, I think it's a lot harder to break into that industry. And so therefore, there are a lot more established white actors who will get get these roles because you know they've they've if you will paid their dues they've they've been in the business a long time they've worked their way up and they absolutely are very well deserving but because of that it's very hard to get new talent in because of the big money involved and because no one wants to take a risk on new talent um, when it comes to film um, and so therefore I would I would actually say that film and TV is a lot less diverse oh, sorry maybe maybe less so TV but more so film is yeah. less diverse because because of that reason. Um, and, and that's quite a, quite, quite a sad thing. <laughs> I mean, there was also, so Yari Sahidi was just announced as the, the first black actress to play Tinkerbell in the in a new film ad- adaptation. And already there seems to be a bit of a resistance to this. I mean, there's, there's such outrage on, on changing any characters because The Little Mermaid had the, the exact same problem, didn't it, with Ariel? And it's just... It's just ludicrous because, and, and that's another thing of, but if they do take a risk, they get, they get flat for it, if you will. They get beaten down for it. And it's just incredibly, it just makes it even more difficult for everyone involved. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just really, really sad. <laughs> but also, especially with the, with the Disney examples of characters, generally there is no description of any aesthetic nature to that individual anywhere. There's no prescribed, you know, identity of that it's a character that has is written by a name and unless you read the descriptions very little information is said about it which means they can be anyone um they you know can be from any background you know i've seen pantos where snow white has has been a, a, a black actress well you know some people say oh well in the story it says you know she's called that because of her 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 skin but uh, oh, come on we're in we're in 2020 now like think that you need to which is what we're all discussing here those historical and that's the things those historical things that embedded in that time in that period serving a very particular ideology need to be thrown out the window and reinvented you know for the for the 21st century because well that's right simon people... because because they've been doing the muppet christmas carol for for 20 years where muppets are playing victorian characters but that's okay too <laughs> yeah yeah but it's this inheritance this constant inheritance and we, I don't know why we're so, we so need to be part of this historical lineage when actually, do we want to inherit that history, especially Britain with its imperial past, with all of those aspects? Surely we want to wake up and put those things right? Well, they're doing it on ITV. They're doing the Singapore grip. You know, they're bringing all, the, they're bringing all these, hist- you, know, um, empire, uh, what, you know, the white narratives and the empire empire narratives but they're not putting it from the opposite perspective they're putting it from their own perspective so in terms of commissioning this is still happening mm-hmm. we're still we're still seeing the, these this material this writing commissioned from a, from a from a white gaze perspective you know so that needs to change as well because now why can't, why do we always have to see it from that perspective why can we not see it from a different perspective and use the talent pool that we have <laughs> and i'm picking up on the so the oscar diversity rules do we think that's something that can be implemented in theater with regards yeah. to- uh, easily I, I, ab, ab, absolutely you know i i don't see don't, don't see why not we have had this talent pool you know a representative representative talent pool in my view, for the last you know thirty years in you know in in in, in theatre, um, I think it's only until the last I don't know ten. There are probably a lot more senior people than me that have been advocating the change, but now because we have the platforms of social media and um, the reach value now can get to people and people can be more aware of what, those 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 issues now. But um, abs- absolutely, I, you know, I, I I wouldn't be surprised if the Olivier's had to mm-hmm. adapt that next for, for yeah. you know for, for for their for their criteria and they should because if the Oscars are and the BAFTAs are why should why should others not? Yeah. And I want to now move on to to training because you talked about when you went into Royal Academy 
and we I think a lot of colleges recently have spoken up about their realizing that they kind of let students down um from your perspectives Evan and Luke like I mean obviously I went to arts ed as well so like we obviously had a very different I imagine we had a different experience how was arts ed for you with regards to to your training did did you feel any any difference um I I, I think I think there was there's, there's been some interesting discussions about um I've actually there's actually been quite a lot of discussion that I've I've been privy to about um racism at said if you will as 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 a topic and um I mean the experiences that have been shared on on that and and hearing how they how people have been spoken to like um girls at the ballet bar being told uh, specifically people uh, girls of color being told that their their bums are sticking out or their bums are too big for 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 this and it it doesn't work and and just kind of um it, it's more it's more of the underlying current of of uh, the, the regular nagging racism if you will that's that's a lot more frustrating than the blatant obvious racism because blatant obvious racism you you can deal with but it's the more subtle racism that's incredibly frustrating and incredibly hard to to weasel out and there's um that there's the, the the question used to get thrown around a lot or probably still does why do all the students of color want to uh why do they always congregate together why do they always create their own clique if you will and um i mean after the stories that i've heard about staff being if if you will being a little bit lazy and going and and calling the same student by the wrong person's name because there's only three if you will black students in the year and so rather than learning them as three individual black students you just get the one black student who, who, name who keeps getting used on all of them or for example it's just like and, and they, this is just an example of what i've heard of um, someone literally getting assessment feedback of another student who ha both of them happened to be black and it wasn't until the name was mentioned at the end that it was like oh oh I'm so sorry let me get your feedback I've, I've clearly got the wrong person it's like you wouldn't have done that if it was another white student because you would have consciously made the effort to learn the individual the individuality of that person and learn therefore their name because of that but it just it feels like you do get lumped into a group and I think the reason that we people of color, if you will, create a kind of clique um, is because shared experience and because we go through the same things and we understand in the same way and we live life through the same eyes. And so I think that is why you end up not, I don't even feel like it's by choice. I feel like we kind of in a way get pushed into one group in the corner because it's like you all behave the same, you all look the same. I, I don't know. It, it, I, I didn't have particularly negative experiences, but on hearing uh, friends' friends' experiences, it, it is quite frightening, if you will. It is, it is kind of like, wow, something really does need to be done, and and um, it is being done. Um, there, there is a lot of good discussion on that point going on, um, but just things like having some, having more than even one staff member of colour. I didn't have a single. Uh, teacher of, of colour when whilst I was training. Not that I can think of off the top of my head and I doubt I would have forgotten. Um so I, I and and stuff is being done to remedy that if you will stuff is being put in place. But the fact that three years ago it wasn't in place is like, come on, like we really need to get going on that if you will. Yeah, because I'd said in particular but now that they've got I think four new appointments within their faculty. Um so like I say, it is progress, and whether that's symptomatic of an outcome of what happens, at least it's happening. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, regardless of the reason, I'm happy to see progress being made. I'm happy to see uh, a forward, men forward thinking mentality, and um, I, I do think they're being very good. And I, I trust Chris, Chris Hocking, and um, I, I think he's brilliant. So I, I do trust that he will work towards that. Um, and I just, I just really hope so because it is kind of heartbreaking to, to think back on the experiences and hear people's experiences, such as what I mentioned. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, I, I, but again, I personally managed. To, I kind of just keep my head down as a person, so I kind of, I managed to avoid a lot of that. But um, just knowing that it happened was quite upsetting. Well, I mean, with with me, I don't know if you know, um, we as ex-members of the, Ra uh, the Equity Race Equality Committee, we created um, our own consultancy group to support 
every those drama schools so um people in faculties and the students as well so once you know when when all of this was announced we got together as a group and created our own support group um and we we opened our arms and extended our arms to all the drama schools and students if they wanted any help and we sat down and we spoke to them um with a number of them um and i, I think what we see with our drama schools for me is very, very sad and disappointing because um, a lot of this has been going on for, for too long. Um, and these are our future, this is the future generation we're talking about of our industry who are very vulnerable, you know, are in a, a new environment that they're not used to. They're tired, they're mentally exhausted, they're physically exhausted. Um, and those institutions should have been there um, to protect them, but they, but they didn't. Um, and now, you know, we're seeing a lot of, in my view, a lot of um, reactive change um, that a lot of people are just reacting quickly to the issue. You know, a lot of these press releases are happening in, uh, about institutional racism and students are coming forward. They're being brave and coming forward and telling us about their experiences, which is, you know, which, which is really, really bad. Um, and they need support. Um, but also the faculty members um, in those drama schools don't know how to manage this situation and that's why you get these reactive um, decisions about things oh there's we, we have a problem with racism in our school let's um let, let, what, what can we do now uh, let's do that let's do that it's a very very reactive and very you know trembling approach um that you know a lot of people a lot of the drama school need to sit down and reassess their their policies you know about this you know i had a lovely a lovely um ex-student of a uh, of, of a school up um, up north who came to me because she, she found out that we create this group and said look I want to create induction classes for new students because I was the only black student on the course and nobody helped me okay and she said ask me can you help me um, and advise me on what I can what we can do and this was a girl who was also very very vulnerable but wanted to help wanted to put back from not receiving any help. And I could have cried when I got that, when I got that phone call from her. And she now is doing induction classes for all new um, ethnic minority um, students on, on their course, but she's being proactive yeah. about it. She's a student, not the faculty, a student, an ex-student that's being proactive about it. And for me, that's such a positive thing that our students are thinking um, and they're thinking, how will I had that bad experience? How can I put back? How can I give back to help again? And these are the things that we need. These are the creative ideas that we need in our drama schools to support, you know, vulnerable students who are the future of this industry. Amazing. Um, and we've got to talk about some positive things. Because obviously, Luke, in particular, you you've worked at the Hope Mill Theatre, who probably just announced one of the best castings that I've seen this year. With <laughs> of all those many castings this year. <laughs> all those castings, but I mean, they're certainly ahead of the, the game, aren't they? And leading yeah, the way. I mean, it's, it's piercing yeah. casting behind it. Um, but yeah, let's talk about that. I feel like they've listened. And, and I think that's all, that's all we're asking for. I just feel like they've listened and they've gone, do you know what? Let's find a wonderful, diverse cast. And that's all we want. We just want, we don't want, you know, it, uh, over, we don't, want everything we just want a bit of what you've got sort of thing it's just that kind of can you just share it can you just you know e equalize if you will can you please be more conscious when you cast and and i think that's i don't think that's a lot to ask for just to to yeah spread it, the light. it's not hard and it's not new necessarily because as well with what the beauty of what they've assembled is a collection of established performers and some new graduates and emerging talent and this is something that you experienced straight out of college when you went to Summit Playhouse to do working. You were part of an ensemble of incredible performers and you were the fresh face baby of the group. Yeah, work, working was a, was, a, was a really interesting one. They um, specifically, uh, I, I, I want to say, had to um, choose six grads because that's what they wanted. That's what, that's what they were creating. So they were, the whole premise of the piece was six new graduates learning from six established professionals. Um, was the whole premise of the piece and it was beautiful and it was so nice to have that new and uh, established talent 
crossover. And I, I, I think you're absolutely right to mention that about the Hope Mail. And I just think that's wonderful, especially in this time, as we are now, everyone is struggling. Everyone is out of work, if you will, or the majority of us are out of work. So to always be forward thinking of not just about diversity, but thinking about let's, how can we include new talent and include the talent that we've already got. And I just, I think that's great. And I think that should be championed and pushed forward. And yeah, I, I, I agree. I think they've done an incredible job at casting rent and, and it's, I'm very excited for that. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And I hope more people and more casting companies take note of that. And that's the way we move forward. That, that, some, that, that is the problem though sometimes I think Luke the points Luke raises is absolutely right but th this comes back to the issue now of people people who are in positions of influence you know for, for too long especially in the West End I'm sorry if I keep coming back to the West End but even generally actually outside of the West End there have been the same people who have who have the same powers of, of influence you know yeah. from in-house productions you know for, you know from all the big five um, players it's the same people same people last 15 20 years there are no people of color uh, you know creatives among those teams you know so the, I go back again to the same record has been playing over and over and over again so you know what do, what do we need to do to direct, to address these chains of command and these organizational structures in these production companies you know and, and it pleases me that we have theaters like Hope Mill, the smaller theaters that are coming up now, coming up the ranks, you know, that have never been there before, the new institutions with new original ideas, with new structures. And I think, you know, post COVID now, the theater model um, is going to change. You know, it, it already is changing. You know, we see, we observe now with, we know with a lot of digital online theater, the whole theater model is going to change. But what happens is, irrespective of it changing, the structure in the chains of command still remain the same. So we're going to be having the same decisions again and again and again. So we need to address this. Who are these people of influence in these organized, organized, organizational structures and how can we change that? I think you're right. The, the, I, think, I think the point is the industry is so small and there's so few people in such high positions of power with it and it takes... It, it kind of does take them to make a shift like the beautiful, wonderful Nika Burns, who's very consciously chosen. I'm going to cast one of my shows at, and, and make it diverse. I'm going to take everybody's talking about Jamie and make sure that it's, it's diverse casting. And I just think if we get more, um, more of the big wigs, if you will, more of those people sitting in those positions of power, just opening up their doors to, to some diversity. And I think you're right as well with the smaller companies that are new and upcoming. Um, DEM Productions is the one that I did working with and I just think they're fabulous. And I, I, th I think you're right. We need more. What, why, do we, why do we have shows like Phantom of the Opera and Les Mis that have been going on for over 30 years? Two of the longest running shows in this country have not changed in over 32 years. Why? Because the organizational structures have remained the same. I, you can't tell me that there's no, that, that there's no um, actor of color that can play that part because it's precedented in other shows like The Lion King and Memphis and all the other shows. It's precedent that there are actors of talent that could play that part easily. Because there's unbelievable tenors out there that could play that part. But why in 2020 is it not happened yet? And then suddenly, when a show like Les Mis does cast someone, someone of colour, for example, when Amara played Cazette, suddenly there's, okay, fine, it's quite a small uproar, but at the end of the day, there is back, there's a backlash to it. You know, people are against it, and people are like, oh no, that has to be a white English rose, it, it's, it's not right to be like that. And I think that in itself speaks volumes at how important it is to... It's going back like, to Simon's point, isn't it, that it's... It's, these are fictional stories. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, it's, it's fictional stories, and I think yeah. it goes back to that point of inherited. We all know yeah. these mega musicals are made. The set's the same. The direction's the same. This is the same. Often, that ideology is whoever makes that, whoever creates that first role. We're looking for someone to, you know, who fits fill those boots. This. Yeah, and we're not. We're not going to update the the front of house images. So it's going to be someone that you know from where the camera is, sort of looks like that. And that's the problem. This problem of inheritance that happens with those two big shows, decades after decades after decades, and, and people have certain people in their heads that get attached to shows, and they want to see 
a version of them. We need to wipe that out. And I, and I do think, picking up on some of the points you've mentioned, that actually streaming and social media are, are going to help here. Yeah. Streaming has got theatre to so many more people that might not have ever stepped foot in a theatre, that might not have been able to afford theatre, that might have actually never even come across theatre because of where and how it's advertised. And yet now being able to access that, people have gone, actually, this is, this is something I want to know more, but also I demand to see a more diverse cast. I demand to see more diverse creatives. Uh, I want it to be fully representative. And also with things such as Twitter and, and websites, having the email addresses of the, of the executive, you know, of the, of the production companies or whatever, people absolutely should be writing to them because if there's no noise, everything will just tick along and everything will just keep going. And yes, some people will still ignore that noise, but that's the only thing that's going to make, make a difference. And absolutely, the new companies that are out there now, they're the ones driving rightly so this agenda. Now, if everyone's talking about it, that becomes the anticipated and the expected. And that's the only way we can get rid of these, these old historical practices which are being inherited and enacted by a certain group of the industry. Um, and it's, it's absolutely, as, as Luke was saying, we need to be forward looking, we need to be inclusive. And that absolutely, as everyone was saying, is all about those structures of power. How many boards are all white, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, how many creative teams? So I'm, I'm doing some work at the moment, getting ready for Panto Day 2020. The amount of people, well, it is a very, very few number of, of people of colour who have ever designed set or costumes for a panto. Now, why is that? That's not because there isn't talented people out there. That's because people are going to the people that they've always used. It's because people are not looking outside of that narrow thing that they always use year after year, same after same. And of course, what does that breed? It's traditional. Those people are easy to work with. Those people are this or that. In my, I mean, it just gets stale. It just gets really stale and boring. Like, like shows that have been in the West End for over 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> That's not saying that, you know, there's, we love a room. Why, why do, why, what, you know, why, why are these shows going on for 30 years? Why can't we change? You know, are we not a new generation? You know, are we not a new generation of people in a different world? You know, why, why can't writing change? I understand the financial motivation behind it, but it surprises me that, you know, we have a great new show, Hamilton, that came in, you know, two, two, two years ago, written by, you know, written by Lin-Manuel, that was the biggest phenomena on Broadway. Where are our British phenomena yeah. in the West End? Where is our writing? You know, we've got these great, you know, we've got the Mercury Musical, you know, organisations, we've got these all new creative writing. So why isn't money being pushed into those British you know, British stories. Where is our next British phenomenon? Why do we have to play the same record over and over again? And who are, what gives the right to these people to put these stories in front of our faces on a commercial level? Is this gonna be the future stories for our kids? I certainly don't want my kids seeing these stories being repeated, you know, my son. I want them to see some original, original stories that reflect our society and talk about the generation we are today. And why is it why is it still radical to change the race of an actor playing a part? Why exactly. is that still what the fact that we talk about it? I think I think it's important. I definitely think it's important. But the fact that we still talk about it just goes to show how ridiculous it is that it's radical that suddenly we have a black actress playing a part that's always traditionally been white. It's like it shouldn't be like that. And we have a real nature in um, in, in Britain to uh, to not innovate, to, to play it safe and to use the same stories and to yeah. do the same stuff. We're not, we're not the same as America in the sense of, in America, new work gets air, people care and, and audience members as well are interested in innovation and what's going on and what's new and what's moving forward. Whereas here we're like, no, I like this one story that's been going on for 30 plus years and I'm going to stick with that and I don't want to see anything new. I just want to see that same, same thing done by the same looking people forever and, and, and it sounds like the english curriculum to me <laughs> yeah it absolutely is we we don't we, we don't innovate very well here we're very stuck in our ways and and as you as you said simon that leads to laziness that is lazy and yes. um it's being stuck in this idea of oh it's just tradition well tradition sucks then change it 
Yeah, and, and, that, that, and that sets off the ripple effect of what we of what we were originally talking about. That theatres like Billingham are stuck in that same mentality, bringing back the same actors, rewriting the same story, but in a different way. This ex this is exactly what we were talking about earlier. That you know, and and it's a, it's it's a ripple down effect from the top down to the bottom. Also. It's exactly what you said before about um, the National are redoing Dick Whittington and they, they had the decency and they were very lovely in, in emailing us and letting us know we're going to redo the show but we're going to go for a different cast because radically we're going to innovate and do something different rather than recreate and I welcome that you know I'd love to have been a part of it but I welcome them going we're going to do something different I think that's important to constantly be reinventing and finding something new rather than going I'm going to do the same thing we did 10 years ago because well it works then it's like no <laughs> do something new but let's, but let's also think about all those innovative productions of revivals that have played with maybe the gender the sexuality or the race of a character to uncover interesting narratives or new narratives company Tallower's production of guys and dolls for example you know there have been so many that i'll actually bring new light to those old productions and reimagine them for new generations and that's something that we shouldn't be scared of because innovation and the willingness to evolve are the only things that will keep theatre alive otherwise it will be a museum piece yeah, yeah. and they we'll all be watching whatever the new versions of the mousetrap are year in year <laughs> out and you know we've already we been are still doing cyber there <laughs> and then people the problem is people get so attached to those when for example there's a new set coming or there's a new production it's like you can't touch with you know the 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 sanctity of the original but original comes from an origin and origins origin stories evolve and then it's about that process of bringing it to the present day and i think as soon as you forget the society the date the time and the period you're living in you are just wiping out and distancing yourself from reality completely agree and i think it is like i said i think we're on the cusp of change especially with the new digital content i know for example the sound sisters barn theater have just announced that ryan carter has been appointed as a creative director of digital content. So that in itself should spearhead this whole kind of new movement to getting, because like I say, it's, for me as well, it's, it's not just about seeing representation and seeing actors of color playing these original parts. You, we want to hear their stories. I want to see their stories come through. I don't want to see the creatives come through rather than just and I don't want it to be a gimmick as well. I don't want it to be a yeah. surprise. I don't want it to be like when, um, uh, was it called Crazy Rich Asians came out? That was radical. That was, oh my God, look, a story just about Asian people. But I don't want it to be that. I want that to be available as a norm and just a, oh look, another story about this or oh look, another story, rather than the same dry action films with 10 white guys <laughs> pretending to be hard for two hours. You know, I want to see... Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> oh, I think I'm, I'm I'm very proud of Ryan. You know, I think what yeah. he's done is, is is I'm I'm so happy that that appointment's been made. And I've worked with that team, the barn. We did we did we did the Broken Wings song for Lebanon um, with with that team, and they're an amazing team. I mean, he's already um, he's already demonstrated his his expertise with you know yeah. turn up with the turn up London gig that he did um, following the Black Lives Movement. Um, and it pleases me to see those appointments because then it goes back to the points that we're talking about before about how are these organizational structures going to change and these people people of influence who has such you know has significant decisions on how shows are produced and cast when we get when are we going to see a dismantling of this and change and a shift in this and that appointment pleases me um a lot yeah he's going to do great things definitely Right, anyway, I've probably taken up so much time of your Sunday afternoons. Um, but that's been brilliant. Thank you all so, so much. Can I thank Simon as well, actually? Because I know that he challenged Billingham Theatre um, asking for a, um, a statement. And I know that he's also championing this issue as well with the yeah. lack of diversity being, being a panto uh, online forum, you know. So I just wanted to thank him um, for challenging that issue. Well, oh, thank you very much. I mean, I think that's very kind of you to thank me, but it, actually I'm a voice that's trying to use a platform to 
encourage people to open their eyes and to take stock and reflect on their work. Because if we, if we don't do that, if we don't reflect on what's happening now or what people have been doing, there's no way you'll change because we do know that the industry is often fast moving. You know, you're in the, you're in the house room, you've got this amount of time to cast it, but you need to take stock and go, what, what, what am I doing here? What, what have I done? What's wrong with it? What's happening? Um, and, and you know, it's, it's not just me. There are other, other people that have written stuff as well. No, I, I, um, say, I say it though, because you released the step, you released the, um, the casting, but people assumed that you were something to do with it when you tweeted it, and people didn't realise that you weren't—you were nothing yeah. to do with it. Um, and you'd or, you'd already challenged these issues previously. That's that, that's why I'm saying that. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's something I'm passionate about. It's something I'm very passionate about. It's something that I've been been looking into and writing about since 2009. Um, back back in 2009 was the first piece of work that I did looking at the commercial sector the subsidised sector and then the sort of intermediate sector where, where councils work with a, a production company looking at casting practices then. And um, it hasn't changed that much since then. And it now is the time where it has, it has to, because 80% of shows are not going ahead in Panto land this year. That gives producers an extra year to go back to look at those scripts. To can go I, repeat, back and do all can that. I repeat your figures? Three performers out of 42, is that right? Out of 42 shows announced 42. so far casting wise. Right. So far. So yeah. far, okay. So how, far. Yeah. How, propor how proportionate? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and but also, sorry, I just do want to say this before because I know we're going to wrap up, but there was a question before about, you know, casting is done quite early for Panto, which it is for mm. either the, the key star or other people. This year, though, what with coronavirus, a lot of casting was held back. So the casting that we're hearing now is only being made now or in the last few months, generally, at the shows that are popping up. So there really is no excuse in that essence. Often what will happen is your, your key people will be cast maybe a year out so that you can start, you know, producing the marketing and all the rest of it for you. September, usually by now we're having auditions for ensemble and things. So maybe through February onwards, casting. Well, Luke, Luke's point as well, that the reasons they, they always give is that no one's available. Yeah. It should be available now. <laughs> it's, a bit like, it's a bit like the big musical um, um, reasoning, why there were no black people in that show, which was a show set in New York. Yeah. Nobody was available. Really? But I think it, like, it's, it's important as well to add that like, someone like Liam Meller, who sometimes is the director of a, the show as well, and appoints actors that he acts as an agent for as well. So like, it's a club. Kind of, it's a club. It's their, yeah. own, their own. It's their own club. But it's the thing that needs to break. It needs to... We need to move away from there. And like I say, there are, I mean, we've got Jamie Hensley coming up in Aladdin. That's the only casting announcement that's at Luton Who Estate. We don't know whether there's going to be a more diverse cast amongst that. But We don't. And have, have you seen the poster? <laughs> I mean, we've got exoticism and orientalism going all over the place there. Which, which town is that? So this is Luton Who. Oh, the Luton. Oh, that Luton. Yeah. That, that... That, that ethnically diverse town, Luton. Yeah, in a big top. I think they've, they've built a site-specific tent, haven't they? Um, they he's playing like... the genie, isn't he, Jamie? I think he's playing the genie. Yeah, yeah. Have they announced the other the other parts for the casting? It's just Aladdin. Yeah, yeah. they haven't announced that yet. Um, and then the only other Aladdin casting we know is that in the um, Otters Pool Adventure in Liverpool, uh, where Yona Higgins is playing Spirit of the Ring. Some of you might remember her from um, Cleopatra. Um, in the 90s but yes so apart from apart from that so again that whole general casting of if you are a performer of color you probably would be the fairy or the genie or the villain <laughs> it kills me yeah just, it's just the one the one show for me that i'm like you could at least if you're going to do that one show you could at least cast it diverse and i do think there's a difference between if you're doing an amateur dramatics production and and you you really are limited in who you have to pick from that's completely different but if you're going to fund it if you're going to put money towards it if you're going to do it semi-professional or professional you need to think about these things and i think it's very important obviously we've got jack at um seven eggs uh played by jacob mcintosh which isn't um which is yeah no, that's that's not not unusual, but it's not. It's if you look representationally across principal boys across, then generally they are white. Exactly. 
Right. Well, thank you very, very much. That's been brilliant. Really, thank really do appreciate it. Thank you for leading it. Thank you for bringing us together and giving us something mm. to talk about. Definitely, we should do this again in a year and see what has changed. No, we should do it. We should do it after Panto season. Really. Yeah, let's do that. Then we, then we can we'll know. That's what what happened over the Panto. Uh, I'll uh, get the stats. I'll get the stats in part order. Two. And it'll be much, it'll be interesting because we know we've got a finite number. So we'll definitely be able to do that number yeah. crunching and have a look um, at how and what happened. Definitely.